Many people are in relationships that seem so perfect to everyone on the outside. And for some of those people, the relationship is so amazing most of the time. But sometimes, one person in that couple starts to show their true colors. And as time passes, their behaviors get worse and worse. And with those worsening behaviors, so many people get stuck in an endless cycle of their partner acting out and then apologizing and then things being amazing again, only for them to inevitably turn worse again. Some people argue that that is what happened with Lori and Mark, and when an argument broke out on one fateful night, everything came to a head. But before I get into the case, I want to say a huge thank you to Dave for partnering with me on today's video. Finances can be so intimidating no matter your education, background, or how smart you might be. We all need a little bit of financial help sometimes, and that is why I love Dave. Dave is the banking app that is leveling the playing field and making managing your finances so much easier. Dave gives their members something that traditional banks won't. Interest-free cash advances up to $500 in five minutes or less with no credit check and no late fees. It all started with overdrafts, being that Americans pay banks billions in overdraft fees every year. Dave wanted to make those predatory fees a thing of the past. With Dave, if you've overdrafted your account, they will spot you the money you need without charging the standard $35 because guess what? Overdrafts happen. I actually recently overdrafted my account because all of my bills, including my rent and my student debt payments, were taken out of my account before I got paid. And thanks to Dave, I avoided the overdraft fee while I waited for my paycheck to clear. Since Dave introduced advances back in 2017, their users have avoided losing $2.5 billion in overdrafts thanks to advances. The bank's response is, banks are starting to cut back on those predatory charges to make up for it. Dave's extra cash account gives you the money you may need to fill the gas tank, buy those groceries, or spot the extra cash that you need to make rent without having to wait for your next paycheck. No interest, no hidden fees. So, download Dave today at dave.com slash Rachel Shannon and you can get up to $500 in five minutes. No credit check and no late fees. For terms and conditions, go to dave.com slash legal. Eligibility criteria and instant transfer fees may apply and banking services are provided by Evolve, member FDIC. Again, head to dave.com slash Rachel Shannon and you can get up to $500 in five minutes or less when you download Dave. Thank you again so much to Dave for partnering with me on today's video. With all of that being said, let's get into the case. This is the story of Lori and Mark Phillips. 51-year-old Lori Phillips married 48-year-old Mark Phillips back in December of 2018 after being together for two years, living together in a home in Onalaska, Wisconsin. According to Lori, Mark was someone that she could just have so much fun with. She could be herself around him, and the two had a good relationship with her describing them as inseparable most of the time. Their typical weekends were spent having some drinks together at home. They would sit in the hot tub together and catch up on whatever TV shows they were watching together. However, the one thing in the relationship that was a bit of an issue, again, according to Lori, is that sometimes when Mark would drink a bit too much, he could get a bit of a temper. He could get jealous and often accuse her of cheating on him. On the evening of Saturday, February 22nd, 2019, Mark and Lori went out to meet a few friends for dinner. Mark and Lori were going to be moving away from the area to Bismarck, North Dakota, because Mark got a new job there. So, this was sort of a last hurrah with their friends, Hannah and Adam, who they probably weren't going to see for a while after that. By 4.08 p.m. that day, they met at the Sloopy Alamater Mater in La Crosse, where they had dinner and drinks. Their interactions were captured on surveillance footage from the bar, showing them leaving at 6.13 p.m. After that, the group continued their night at a nearby bar called the Dive Bar, where they stayed for a bit to do a raffle. After that, Lori and Mark made the about 11-mile drive to the Holman area, where they went to Features Sports Bar and Grill for another drawing. 
the other friends did not go with them to this next bar. When they got to this next sports bar, they ran into a man named Terry, who was an old acquaintance of Lori. But this was not someone that Mark was very fond of at all. Now, according to Lori, when they got to the bar, Terry was across the bar, not even interacting with them or the friends that they were there to see. But when Mark saw Terry at the bar, an argument broke out between Mark and Lori. According to Lori, Mark accused her of having slept with Terry in the past, saying that Terry only showed up to the bar that day because he knew that Lori would be there. Again, this is something that Lori denied and so did Terry. It literally just seemed to be a coincidence, which I don't doubt because hello, small town, not much to do in the area. But despite that, he kept saying that he was going to punch Terry in the face for coming to the same bar as them. This was pretty common and frequent behavior for Mark, getting really jealous and upset when he would drink. After that argument started, they went back to Mark's truck, and according to Lori, Mark grabbed her, pushed her up against the truck, and put her in a chokehold, which caused her earring to fall out. At that point, Lori asked Mark to drive her back to the dive bar so that she could meet up with with her friends so that they could drive her home at some point. He did just that, dropping her back off at the dive bar with Adam and Hannah. However, Mark kept Lori's phone with him. Apparently, again, that is something that he would frequently do when the two fought. He would take her phone and go off with it. Shortly after dropping her off and driving away, however, Mark turned around and went back to the dive bar asking Lori to come out and talk. She did just that, but apparently Mark immediately made some comment trying to fight again, so she turned around and went right back inside to sit with her friends. Mark followed her in and may have spoken to her briefly, still very obviously upset, saying some pretty mean things in front of her friends, but eventually he left the area where she was sitting and kept his distance, instead talking to someone that he knew on the other side of the bar. After a few minutes, Mark calmed down and gave Lori her phone back before returning back to his friends. By 8.52 p.m., Mark texted Lori from across the bar saying, I'm so sorry, I love you. A little bit after that, Hannah and Adam told Lori that they were going to leave because they had plans to meet other friends out at another bar. At that point, things had calmed down for Lori and Mark, so she told her friends that she was fine, that she would just go back home with Mark. The friends left and Lori and Mark got back in the truck and started driving home. On that ride home though, Mark apparently brought up Terry once again and pretty much worked himself back up and they got into another heated argument. They fought that entire 30 minute drive home. At some point in the argument, Lori even handed her wedding ring back to Mark, to which he replied, please, please don't give this back to me. My dog is running around with her bone and sometimes she cries when she's looking for a place to hide it, so don't mind if you hear some rustling around in the background. She's just carrying around her bone, trying to find a place to bury it. She loves burying her bones. You can hear her little whine right there. The next part of this story is reported a bit differently at the trial and in the initial police report. Now, when they got home, Lori said that she stayed in the car, sitting in the driver's seat while Mark went back inside. At some point, Lori had told Mark that she was going to leave for the night, so after Mark had been inside for an unknown period of time, Mark came back outside and said that he needed to get some things out of the truck. He started going through his items that were located in the passenger seat of the truck, and as he was doing so, he apparently found a beer koozie and picked it up and threw it at her, continuing to throw drunken insults while doing so. She then took the koozie and threw it back out the door, I guess past Mark since the passenger side door was still open and it ended up landing on the ground. At that point, Lori said that Mark then went around the front of the truck and aggressively charged towards the driver's side window where Lori was sitting. She said that he had this evil look on his face and this was the angriest that she had ever seen him. 
She said that he either tried to punch the window or something, basically making an angry motion showing that he was about to hit at the window or try to open the door or something like that. The next part of the story is also a bit confusing, but the way I understand it based on the photos that I've seen of Mark and Lori's home, they have a driveway that is sort of a Y shape with one side pulling up to the back of the house and the other side going to the garage but the driveway was pretty big and there was a spot in front of the home where you can pretty much turn around without having to make a three-point turn. The police reports say that they pulled the truck up to the back door of the home, so I believe when the whole argument was taking place, the truck was facing away from the home and towards the road so that the passenger side door was facing the home so that she could just drop Mark off and he went inside and then came back out to get his things, but again, I think the truck's end, so the trunk was facing the house and the front of the truck was facing towards the road. Either way, in that moment, as Mark was charging at the window, Lori said that she was afraid of Mark. She didn't know what he was going to do if he got to her. So, just as Mark was approaching the window, she took off. She drove down the driveway and took a right turn onto the road, driving to a nearby subdivision. As she initially drove off, the passenger side door had still been open, but it shut itself when she made that right turn out of the driveway. She then pulled over in that nearby subdivision and waited to see if Mark was going to follow her. She then took out her phone and sent two very lengthy text messages to Mark, implying that she wasn't going with him to Bismarck, wishing him the best. She waited in that subdivision for a few minutes, but as she was parked there, a car drove by her and she worried that it might have been a cop. So, she decided to drive away from the area and go look for a hotel room to stay in for the night. I will explain more about the whole cop passing by thing later in the video. Now, Lori initially went to a nearby Comfort Inn, but they didn't have any rooms available, so she went online and booked a room at the Baymont. However, when she got there, they told her that she booked the room for the following night, Saturday night, instead of Friday they told her that they did not have any availability for that night. After that, she drove to a nearby restaurant to use the bathroom. She then parked in the back of their parking lot and slept in her car. After a few hours of sleeping, she was too cold to spend the rest of the night in the truck, so she figured by that point, Mark had probably gone inside of the home, calmed down, and went to bed, so she was probably safe to return back. She then drove back home, arriving by 2 a.m., quietly entering the pitch black home, hoping to avoid waking up Mark. When entering the home, she went through the back door, which was unlocked. This surprised her because she said that Mark said that he was going to be changing the locks before she originally left. After entering, she said that she saw Mark's shoes by the entrance of the home, so she assumed that he was inside and asleep. I will note that Mark did have two pairs of the exact same shoes, so that explains what we find out in just a minute. Now, the master bedroom was located on the first floor of the home, so she assumed that Mark was in there, so Lori went upstairs to the second floor to sleep in another bedroom. Now, the home does have cameras inside and outside of the home that are motion activated. According to Lori, before she went upstairs to go to sleep, she shut the cameras off to avoid waking up Mark. They probably made a sound or something like that when they detect movement to turn on, so she wanted to avoid waking him up. That's why she turned them off. After that, Lori slept for another two to four hours before waking up that next morning and going downstairs to the master bedroom, looking for an apology from Mark. However, when she got to the bedroom, she noticed that Mark was not there. Lori's next thought was to go outside and to the garage to see if his car was still parked there. She wondered if maybe after she left for the night, Mark went back out and saw some friends and maybe crashed at one of their places. But then, as she walked towards the garage, out of the corner of her eye, she noticed that Mark was outside, lying on his side on a snowbank in the driveway. Immediately, according to Lori, she freaked out and went straight to him. That is when she realized that Mark was most likely 
dead. After that, by 6 29 a.m., Lori ran back inside to grab her phone and call the police. She said that Mark looked frozen to the ground and looked like he wasn't alive. She sounded frantic and panicked on that phone call. The dispatcher advised her to go back outside and attempt to flip him onto his back to start CPR. She said that she tried that, but she was unable to because of how heavy he was. She then started explaining the situation that happened last night, saying that he chased her down in the truck and now she is worried that he slipped and fell while doing so. She said that she didn't know he was out there all night, only finding him that next morning. She did eventually say that he is beyond help, that he is blue and frozen to the ground, so she didn't think that CPR was going to do anything. My Okay. When was the last time you saw him? 
last night at like 11 o'clock. Okay, okay. He was, he was chasing my, me down for, like, in the truck and I just took off. He was, was chasing you down, down in the truck? Yes. Oh my God. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay, yes. okay. Yes, I didn't know he was out here. <gasps> okay, okay. And the last time you saw him was last night? Yes. Oh my God. I know this is very hard for you, ma'am. Do you want to do CTR right now? There's no reason I can go. Okay. Okay, please. I know this is difficult. Tell me, please, why does it look like he's dead? No, he's frozen to the ground. He's frozen to the ground right now? <coughs> the Do you think he's beyond any help? Yes. Okay. I'm sending someone to assist you. Please leave everything as you found it. Okay. Oh my God! I don't even know how this happened. Oh. Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God! Honey. Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God! Ma'am, I'm right here. By the time police arrived to the scene, they found Lori kneeling over Mark's body. According to first responders, they observed footprints in the snow that led from the home almost all the way to the garage, and then they turn around and go towards where Mark's body was found. There are then another set of footprints from Mark's body towards the house and then back to Mark. This sort of confirmed Lori's story about going outside, heading towards the garage, seeing Mark, and then running towards him, and then running inside to grab her phone, and then coming back out as she was calling 911. The officer noted that Mark's body was lying on his side against a snowbank in the driveway. There were also a pair of sunglasses thought to be Mark's about 15 feet away from where his body was found. So that could mean that at some point he was either running or something else happened and his sunglasses flew off of him before he ended up in that snowbank. By the time police were able to speak with Lori, it was clear that she was distraught, upset, and extremely emotional. She was sort of rambling things off to police at that point. She started by saying she didn't know that he was out there, then gave police a brief statement about what happened that previous night. She said that they got into a fight, he charged at the truck, so she took off. She said that she didn't hurt him. She said that she didn't know what happened, and again, she didn't know that he had been out there all night. Again, this initial statement was more of just rambling things off. Of course, after being at the scene and finding Mark's body and getting that initial statement from Lori, police took Lori into the station for questioning and Mark's body was also sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. I do want to note that when police first examined Lori, they did note that Lori claimed to have red marks on her neck after the initial fight between them and police did observe a bruise on her upper chest area, most likely from that chokehold. In the police interrogation, Lori explained pretty much everything that we've discussed up to this point. She explained the argument that the two got into once they got to that third bar, again, when they saw Lori's old acquaintance, Terry. She said that Mark often got very upset and jealous when he would drink. But 
As she was explaining the situation, she started crying and saying that normally when he didn't drink, they were inseparable. She said that they had so much fun together and that overall, he was a really good guy. He wasn't this awful, abusive guy that it might seem like he was. Disagreements, arguments like this in the past, like a, a jealousy thing about other guys and stuff like that, did that happen often? And I don't want to, we're not speaking ill of no. anybody, but we just need, um... Just when he drinks. Okay. Do you want me to go over right here right now, and you can ask him if he came here to see me? So I walked over, he said, yes. He goes, and I'm going to come and punch his face off. <laughs> you know, like, talking like that. And yeah. I said, Terry, I said, my husband thinks that um, you came here to see me. He goes, that's crazy. And I said, Mark, I said, he said, that's crazy. Of course, Mark didn't believe it. Mm -hmm. He was sitting with his wife at a diff totally different area. We weren't even near them. I was with my friends. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this would happen when, when Mark would drink. Was Mark a big drinker? I mean, did he drink all often? Or what? what Mark kind of works in the cities. Yeah. So, Mark works in the cities Monday through Thursday, comes home maybe Thursday or Friday. And then, I, then in the weekends, we just spend time together, like, nonstop. We are inseparable in the weekends. Mm -hmm. Because we just, we love to be together, you know? Yeah. She then explained the rest of the night to the best of her memory, how after the argument, she asked him to drop her off at the dive bar, which he did. He then drove away with her phone before coming back and spending some time apart from Lori with his own friends at the bar. Then when they drove home, another argument broke out and when they got home, he got out of the truck and Lori said that she was leaving. So he came back out from the home, started getting things from the passenger side of the car before getting upset and running around the front of the truck and started running towards her side of the window and was trying to hit at her window. 
She said that she didn't know if he was trying to open the door or if he was about to punch through the window. After he was on the driver's side of the car and not in the front of the car, that is when she took off. She said that she did not think that she hit Mark with that truck and when asked if she knew how he died, she told the officers that she had no idea. My worst fear is that he chased me down the driveway and slipped and fell and then I just left him there and I didn't even know he was there because otherwise I would have just come back and I just, and then I pulled in the driveway today and I didn't even see him. I had no idea he was there. And that, that, that would have helped. Well, maybe it was like two o'clock. It could have helped. I don't know. Oh my God, I just can't believe he was out there. Like, you didn't, when you were pulling away, you didn't see him? No. Okay. I did not, like, at, this, at that time, I just had to get the hell out of there. I didn't see him. I didn't know what he was and doing. Just the, the, the door wasn't, your door, the driver's door wasn't open or anything. He wasn't in there. My door was not open. The driver, the passenger the side passenger was open. Um, but he was he, on my side. He, yeah, he couldn't have got the, the clothing or anything caught in the door because the door wasn't open. I, uh, I do not remember my door being open unless if he got it open last second. I do not, but I know that that's what he was coming for, but I don't, I, 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 just, I can't point. remember that. That's why it's so beneficial that we have the cameras. Sure. In my opinion, when she was talking about the argument that broke out with them, I do think she was genuinely looking back, thinking about Mark and his behaviors, and I think she felt bad for talking about him the way that she was. She knew that she was making Mark out to look like a mean, possessive drunk, and she expressed that that was not the real Mark. So, I think that is why she got upset. But then, when she talks about the actual incident with the truck, I think she's trying her best to recount the story, but there are certain things that she doesn't remember, which I do think is a bit strange. That could be chalked up to her just having experienced the trauma, so there are certain things that could just be blacked out, or she might be trying to omit certain details that don't put her in the best light. What do you think? Now, like I said, as Lori was being questioned, Mark's body was undergoing an autopsy. The autopsy found that Mark had multiple abrasions on his head and neck area, including facial abrasions and then abrasions to his torso, as well as on the left side of his trunk. He was found to have a cerebral subdural hemorrhage or a brain bleed, which is caused by extensive head injuries. He also suffered from left-sided rib fractures with associated hemothorax, which means that there's blood collecting in the pleural space, which is the area located between your lungs and rib cage. One of those broken ribs also punctured his lung. There were also several abrasions and contusions to his arms and legs, with the left side appearing more severe than the right. The medical examiner determined that Mark's cause of death was multiple blunt force injuries, with blood loss being a significant factor into his death. But the manner of death, i.e. whether it was murder, accidental, etc., was listed as undetermined. According to the state's medical examiner, these injuries are caused by significant amounts of force, not something like a slip and fall on ice. The most likely cause of these injuries is from being hit with that truck, and I would have to agree. Based on what I just told you, he had abrasions all over his body, severe head trauma, and severe chest trauma. That doesn't just happen from a simple slip and fall on the ice while you're running. It just doesn't. I think it's far more likely that he got those injuries from being hit by the truck possibly even dragged. Again, more on this later. Then, as a part of the investigation, police sent the truck itself to the crime lab to be forensically examined. On the undercarriage of the back of the truck, they found multiple different types of fibers, including one fiber that is three to four inches long that is consistent with the jeans that Mark was wearing when he was found. It was confirmed that Mark's jeans were ripped when his body was found, so that means that it's absolutely possible that he was under that truck at some point, that the truck drove over him or dragged him when he was hit. I do want to note that the fiber found under the truck wasn't 100% confirmed to belong to the exact pair of jeans that Mark was wearing because those were a very common types of jeans that could be matched to so many other pairs, so there was no way to 
to say for certain that they were Mark's exact genes. There wasn't DNA on the fiber or anything like that. So all we know is that it does match Mark's genes, but it also could be a match to a pair of genes that I own or you own or even that Lori owns. At the same time though, this was significant because most cars probably don't just have random clothing fibers stuck to the bottom unless that car has hit someone. Either way, based on all of the evidence that we've discussed up to this point, police felt that they had enough to make a case against Lori for hitting her husband with her car, therefore causing his death. So, Lori was arrested and was originally charged with a hit and run resulting in death, but that charge was ultimately changed to second degree reckless homicide, which carries a max sentence of 25 years behind bars. After that, she had her bond hearing where she was given a $50,000 bond, which she posted, so she awaited her trial at home. Of course, because this case originally happened in 2019, as we know, COVID happened in 2020 and literally delayed everything, especially trials and court proceedings. So, Lori's trial for second-degree reckless homicide didn't start until November of 2023. The prosecution's argument was very clear and simple. The couple got into a big fight on the night of February 23rd, 2019, and in the midst of it, Lori hit Mark with her truck before driving off and leaving him to die in the snow alone. They again brought forward everything that we've discussed up to this point the fight and how the entire situation happened that led to Mark getting angry and then possibly Lori getting upset and hitting Mark with her car in the midst of things. They talked about the severe injuries that Mark suffered as a result of being hit with the truck as well as the fiber evidence taken from the bottom of the truck. All of those things that pointed towards Lori hitting Mark with her truck. One thing that the prosecution pointed out was that when Lori left her house in that truck, she mentioned that she was parked in the other subdivision, like I mentioned. However, when she was sitting there in one of her interviews, she told officers that she thought that there was a cop passing by her, so that is actually why she left the area to go get a hotel. The prosecution argued that if Lori was so scared of Mark and if she truly didn't know that she had just hit him with her car, why wouldn't she want to get police involved? Wouldn't she feel relieved that there was a cop right there to help her get away from Mark? If she did hit him with her car though, that would make sense why she wouldn't want a cop poking around in her business. However, to that, Lori said that she knew that she had been drinking that night, so she was worried about them giving her a DUI. That's why she didn't want a cop around her and why she didn't want them pulling her over. And I think that brings us to a massive aspect of this case, whether or not alcohol plays a role in all of this. Like I said, both Lori and Mark had been drinking that night. Lori would eventually say that Mark wasn't hammered or annihilated that night. He wasn't slurring, he wasn't falling over, he just seemed like a normal amount of angry and drunk. Her, on the other hand, she only had a few drinks. So, while she felt that she was okay to drive and she thought she was in an okay headspace, it is possible that alcohol fueled the both of them. Maybe Lori was snappier than she normally was because of the alcohol. Maybe the alcohol caused her to not even think about where Mark was in relation to the car and her first and only thought was to get away, so that is what she did. Without even realizing that Mark was in front of the car, she may have just hit the gas and ran over him because again, when you're drinking alcohol, you're not thinking through things. You just react a lot of the times. That's why drinking and driving is illegal because you're not thinking through things. You're not thinking, oh, that's a red light. You just think, I'm going to keep driving because I need to go home and I need to go straight. And you don't even realize that the light is red or you don't see the stop sign there or you don't see someone walking across the street like you normally would have. Maybe because of her drinking that night, she truly didn't realize that she hit him. Because to me, she did send him those long text messages breaking up with him and saying that she wasn't going to Bismarck with him. 
Why would she send those messages if she thought she killed him? Again, she could have been doing it to throw police off her scent. That is totally possible. But in that moment, I don't know if she's going to be thinking about that. She would probably just be thinking about getting away from the situation, not pulling over and sending him messages, pouring her heart out to break up with him. I feel like if you are trying to like send text messages like that to throw him off your scent, you would say something like, oh, I'm leaving for the night or, oh, I don't know if like things are going to work out, but you know, I will be out for the night. You stay home or you go out or whatever. She would come up with something that would make it look like Mark is leaving or that she is leaving for sure and she probably wouldn't want anybody to know that she just had a huge fight with him. Again, in my opinion, if you're going to send text messages to throw police off your scent, you're going to send something nice to make it look like you guys were not fighting because if you guys were fighting and police knew that, they're automatically going to think that you had something to do with his death, which they did obviously, as we can see here. Lori's defense, on the other hand, argued that Lori was scared of Mark because of how angry he was. Again, he was the angriest that he had ever been. The defense said that the couple actually had a longer history of domestic abuse than Lori let on. There had been multiple instances of police being involved in their domestic disputes. The defense painted her as a survivor of domestic abuse. She was scared of Mark. She knew that she needed to get out, but at the same time, she loved Mark and didn't want to break it off completely. They talked about how over the course of a few weeks, Mark could tell that Lori was pulling away. He got more possessive, more controlling, more jealous. Anytime Mark would get into these moods where he got violent or angry, Lori would just separate herself from the situation. She would never fight back. She just wanted to remove herself until Mark could calm down. That was a regular thing in their relationship and things were getting worse and worse and worse and more physical in the weeks leading up to his death. Then, everything came to a head on February 23rd, 2019. The defense described how Mark was even more jealous and more violent than he had ever been that night. After the argument happened where Mark got physical with her, she asked to be dropped back off and Mark came back with her in the bar. As I described earlier, he apparently stayed with his friends until Lori decided that they could leave. However, the defense described that when Mark got back to the bar to try to talk to Lori again, when he was standing outside, he was calling Adam over and over and over again, begging him to have Lori come back outside so that they could go home or they could talk or whatever. Eventually, she gave in and again, she went outside to talk to him. He made that comment and then she went back inside. Apparently, after that, the defense described that Mark came back into the bar and was screaming at Lori to get back in the car and go home with him. But again, as we know, she did not do that. She stayed with her friends as Mark went over to his friends and calmed down for the night. Again, as we know, he did calm down after a little bit of time and then he went back and gave Lori her phone back. Then, as we know, Mark texted her from across the bar saying that he was so sorry and that he loved her. At that point, Lori felt that it was okay to go home with Mark. She told her friends that she was going to be okay that night. She really thought in that moment that they would just drive home and Mark would sleep it off. However, as we know, that isn't what happened. Another argument broke out and that continued for the entire 30 minutes until they got home. Once they got home, the argument got even worse and all Lori wanted to do at that point was get away from Mark like she normally did. But Mark wasn't going to let that happen this time. After he came out to get his items from the passenger side door, again, they threw that koozie at each other and then Mark suddenly charged around the truck with an evil look in his eyes. Lori said that she had never seen him so angry. She was terrified at that point. She thought that Mark was about to punch through the window and hurt her. So, once Mark was clear from the front of the truck, Lori's fight or flight mode kicked in and she drove the truck away, not even looking back, just focused on getting away from her abuser. The defense argued that Lori did not hit Mark with the truck. They argued that their specialists say that the truck was spotless with no evidence of her hitting Mark with the truck. 
As I described earlier, it seems like Lori would have driven straight forward to get out of the driveway. She didn't have to back up or turn around. So, if he was hit with the car, it would have had to have been to the front of the car. And the only evidence that was found was to the back of the truck. There was absolutely nothing that could indicate that anybody was hit with the front of that truck. Instead, the defense actually said that Mark was running after the truck after she drove away and he actually slipped and fell on the ice and then may have somehow gotten caught on the truck and was dragged and that is what actually caused his injuries. This makes sense for why Lori didn't realize that Mark may have been hurt and it also explains those fibers that are on the back of the truck. Truck. The defense asked the jury to consider who caused the situation which caused the risk for substantial harm. They also asked the jury to consider whether Lori's actions constitute putting her or Mark's life in an unreasonable risk for harm, or were her actions of driving off justified? Because when it comes to reckless homicide, what you need to prove is that Lori's actions were putting him in immediate danger and that it was unreasonable danger. So, if he was shoveling the driveway and she just decided to take off without looking around to see if she was going to hit anything, that would be reckless homicide. But in this case, it was argued that Mark is the one that caused this situation to begin with. He's the one who charged in front of the truck and went around the truck and came at Lori, making her feel so afraid that she felt that the only thing she could do was to drive away. That is what makes her actions justified, according to the defense. During the trial, Lori also took the stand to testify in her own defense. She continued to say that she was afraid for her life that night. The only reason she took off in that truck like that was because she was afraid of what Mark would do if he got to her window. The actions she took, putting Mark's life in danger, were justified because he was the one who caused the situation to begin with. Therefore, Lori had every right to drive away like she did. She was escaping from an abusive situation. She didn't want to cause his death. She had no idea if she had hit him or caused him any bodily injury, according to her. After hearing arguments from both sides, the prosecution and defense made their closing arguments. Once again, the prosecution said that Lori hit Mark with her car because she was angry at him in the midst of their argument. The defense say that she was scared of her abusive husband, so she fled, not knowing what happened to Mark after. After five days of trial, the jury went in for deliberations. They deliberated for four and a half hours before they came back with their verdict. They actually found that Lori Phillips was not guilty for the second degree reckless homicide of her husband, Mark Phillips. State of Wisconsin versus Lori Phillips, La Crosse County case number 20 CF 364, verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant, Lori Phillips, not guilty. Signed by the juror four person, dated this 10th day of November, 2023. Um, members of the jury, um, as to count one, is that your verdict? I just need you to say yes in unison if that's correct. Yes. All right. With the finding of the, the, the uh, verdict, the court will find that Ms. Phillips is acquitted at this point of the count. Uh, you're released from, I don't even believe there was a bond because of, of um, the appeal process, um, but the case is now concluded. I, I, I never know what to say to everybody about something like this. This is very difficult, and now it's a time to heal to try to figure out how we heal. Um, and um, I hope you know, I know it's been a difficult week, and actually I appreciate that you're all here because I think this is important for the criminal justice system, for everybody to be here. So take care, um, everybody be safe, all right? Thank you. They must have felt that the situation as a whole was caused by Mark and that Lori's actions of driving off when she did were reasonable. The evidence also wasn't very strong to show that she hit Mark with the front of her truck, 
Therefore, she is not guilty in causing the death of her husband. With this case, I do 100% see why the jury came back with their not guilty verdict. I do think that it is actually possible that Mark was running after the car, he slipped and fell, and somehow got caught on the truck and was dragged. In most situations, I would think that that is quite the reach, but the fact that it was icy and slippery and the fact that there was no evidence of him being hit on the front of the car, only on the trunk end of the car, that is very significant. And in terms of this story, the way Lori told the story stayed pretty consistent throughout all of the retellings, all with Mark coming to the side of her window. I do think she probably felt threatened and I do think that her fight or flight mode kicked in and she just left. Obviously, I think it's possible that she did end up hitting Mark with her car and that there's just somehow no evidence of that until he was dragged under the truck and that is why there's only evidence of it under the back part of the truck. But I do think even if she did hit him, I think it was not on purpose. I don't think she ran him down with her car because she was mad. I genuinely think that she was afraid for her life and she just went pedal to the metal and left. Obviously, Mark's family is upset with the verdict. They feel that Lori got away with murder. A lot of them do not believe her side of the story, saying that she lied about a lot of things and that there is a lot of evidence that just doesn't add up to what she is saying. But again, that's just the way the jury felt. These are the people that are supposed to be the least biased. And obviously, hearing that your family members are being accused of being abusive and hearing his name dragged through the mud that is obviously not a fun thing to hear. But after hearing the evidence again, I don't think that Lori meant to hit Mark with her truck. And if she did, I almost feel like she may not have known. Again, I think it's possible that he did get caught on the truck after running after it. And if that's the case, I don't think it's a reach to say that she may not have felt it. It's not like she was running over his body and, you know, it felt like a speed bump and she tried to claim that she didn't feel it, you know? And again, even if she did hit him in that situation, I do agree that Mark is the one that caused the situation to begin with. I do feel like she was just trying to get away in that moment. I don't think she wanted to hit Mark with her car on purpose. However, I do think that alcohol played a role in all of this from both Lori and Mark's sides. I wish that she was at least given a breathalyzer or her blood alcohol level was taken when she was interviewed and mentioned that she was driving home after getting drinks. Obviously, it was several hours later, but at that point, if her alcohol level was above the legal limit, it could be reasonably deduced that she shouldn't have even been driving that night because I do take drinking and driving very seriously. So, I just wish that they looked more into that to see if she could be charged with something related to that. But again, regardless, I do agree with the overall verdict on this one. But that's what I think. Now I want to hear what you all think. Do you think Lori hit her husband with her car? Do you think she just got away with murder? Or do you agree with the defense that he may have gotten himself caught on the back of the truck and was dragged, making it so that Lori had no idea? Let me hear your thoughts on this one in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.